Okay, this is our, our fifth session in this series on biblical counseling, and we're following up on last week's with uh, the topic of what is euthetic counseling, and you can see a little continued below that, because that's what we're actually picking up. This would be part two of that. So just to review a little bit, what we've studied so far, the first session was just an introduction to biblical counseling. What's the difference between biblical counseling and, and secular or humanistic counseling? And then we laid the, the foundation for why biblical counseling by looking at there's a crisis in counseling. We spent pretty much a whole uh, session just determining or looking at the situation as what has happened in and especially within the church, where the church has pretty much given up the idea of counseling. So many evangelical churches just refer people out to psychologists and psychiatrists uh, without ever even getting involved with biblical counseling. And the third session was the role of the Holy Spirit in counseling. When you look at this, it, it may seem like, isn't that out of, out of order? Wouldn't you expect that to be a little bit later on? But I put it as number three because without the Holy Spirit in counseling, uh, biblical counseling is about as useless as, as secular counseling if the Holy Spirit is not doing his work. So that's why we put that in because, it's, uh, again, it's part of the foundation for biblical counseling. When I have people come in and looking for, for biblical counsel, um, I explain to them that the reason that they can have hope is because as believers, we have the Holy Spirit who ministers the word effectively in our lives. We can't do it in, in and of ourselves. So that's why biblical counseling is so important. Then last week, we started to ask, the, and, ask and answer the question, what is neuthetic counseling? And we'll review just a couple of things. Remember, neutheteo or neuthesis, uh, is the biblical word that's used, that's the Greek word. And literally it means to confront, but sometimes it's translated in different ways. And this is what we went over last week. Sometimes you'll see it admonish, or if you see the word teach, it can be one of two words, either the dasko, which means strictly teaching, or to teach in a, in a counseling sense. And then three, you might see it translated sometimes as to warn. To be warned is to be admonished or to, to be taught something. And then we also saw last week that there's three elements to neuthetic confrontation. And first element is that it always implies a problem. Biblical counseling uh, is what I, I, I hesitate even using the word counseling. I, I use it because it's Descriptive, it's what most people are looking at. But biblical counseling is really crisis discipleship. That's what it really is. And it always implies a problem. It's, as opposed to just sitting under and teaching somebody and learning the word, that would be the didasco, you know, didactic uh, in nature. Uh, neuthetic confrontation always implies that there's an issue in a person's life that is causing a problem and needs a change. So neuthetic confrontation always implies that there is a problem, some issue that needs to be addressed. The second element in neuthetic confrontation is to solve by verbal means. Uh, just getting a book and, and trying to read through it is not really the answer. A person needs to be confronted. That's exactly what the word means, admonish, uh, or neuthesis means to be confronted uh, with the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the third element is that it's always for the benefit of the sinner. Okay. Now, there are other benefits also. Uh, obviously, if a church member is uh, undergoing certain issues in life that are, are a hindrance to their sanctification, that also would affect the church. So in that sense, it affects the church as well. But the primary benefit goes to the person who is in trouble. So, now we'll continue on. Neuthetic confrontation and scripture. 
We looked at this last week as well. How does neuthetic confrontation work and why does it work? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is crucial to understand uh, because it really explains in very simple terms how uh, biblical confrontation works. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate or perfectly equipped for every good work. And in those two verses, you find four steps. This is how to help people change. In fact, I've told you that this whole series is based upon two books written by Jay Adams. Uh, first one is Competent to Counsel. Second one is A Theology of Christian Counseling. Uh, but he wrote another book, a shorter book, and it's called How to Help People Change. That whole book is based upon 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. These are the basic four steps. Doctrine or teaching. The word of God is profitable for teaching. That is to lay down what is, what is right, what is wrong. That's the standard. You have to have some sort of standard by which to be measured. And that's including your sanctification. Reproof or conviction. If a person is, is involved in sin, you teach them that what they are doing is wrong, and then the conviction takes over. That's the, where the confrontation takes place. And, and the heart is convicted of sin. Step number three is what's necessary for any true change to take place. It needs to be corrected. All right. I always like to uh, uh, use an analogy on this of, of handwriting. You ever hear the expression, practice makes perfect? You believe that? No, no why not? Practice makes progress. OK. Sometimes. <laughs> Have you ever seen me write my name? I've been writing my name for oh, almost 50 something. Well, oh, what am I saying? <laughs> About 70 some odd years now. <laughs> I was a slow starter. <laughs> it's worse now than when I was in the first grade. My signature. Practice with correction makes perfect. If you don't make strides to correct what you're doing, same thing. I, everybody knows I'm a, I'm a Met fan. I love baseball. That's, that's my sport. And uh, you talk to a batter, just, just constantly taking batting practice is not going to make you a better hitter unless you're making the correction of the things that you're doing wrong. If you have a hitch in your swing or something, if you don't correct it, you can hit that ball all day long. You're not going to get any better. So the same thing with, with sanctification. There needs to be not only an understanding of what you're doing wrong, but the correction, how do you change it? And then the last step is just the ongoing instruction, continued training in righteousness. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand those four steps? And again, I'm not a big fan of having steps, but these steps come right from scripture, so I, that's why I would, would use them. Also, third thing is neuthetic confrontation is scriptural confrontation. It's not, you know, go pointing your finger and somebody putting you, hey, you're doing this wrong. No, it's, it's confronting with the scripture. And, and as we have seen, and we'll see a little bit later even today, it's confronting in love. Love is always at the heart of it. Uh, it's confrontation with the principles and practices of scripture. That's one of the biggest differences between secular and, and biblical counseling is we have a standard, an inspired standard, one of absolute right and wrong. And contrary to secular psychology, psychological therapy, the Christian counselor is intensely involved with the person being counseled. In, in psychology, uh, a psychologist or a counselor is, is trained not to get involved with the patient. You know, there needs to be a a separation, a, a gap. That's where the, in, in fact, Freud, you know, having a person lay down on the couch, making a big 
divide between him sitting up at his desk, you know, and then the person laying down. B big divide. It's not that way. A biblical counselor should be involved with the patient or the counselee because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And there is a, there is a, a personal aspect to it. Okay, does that make sense? And we see that especially in the example of the Apostle Paul. He admonished the elders at Ephesus. He admonished them with tears. Another point of difference between this and secular counseling is a biblical counselor cannot be neutral in counseling. If you've, if you've ever, Rogerian uh, theory, which will actually next week, we're going to, not next week, next week is the semi-annual meeting, but the week after that, we're going to be looking at directive versus non-directive counseling. Rogerian the, uh, psychology is very non-directive. You, you will never have a Rogerian psychologist say, you know, that was wrong before you did that. They'd say, how did you feel when you did that, you know? How do you feel now about it, you know? And there's always a, a, a disconnect. They try to be as neutral as possible. They don't make judgments. Um, whereas in biblical counseling, you make judgments. You realize it was wrong when you shot that guy. <laughs> we have no trouble doing that and saying those, those type of things. Not in a judgmental way, but by confrontation with scripture. Yes. Would Nathan's confrontation with David be a good example? Yes. Yeah. You, who, what, did, what did David do when he heard the story? He says, who is that man? I'm, you know, when, when I get that man, I get my hands on him. Bring him here to me. And what does Nathan say? You're the man. That's you. Perfect example of biblical confrontation. Next aspect of biblical counseling is love in counseling. The goal of biblical counseling is love. Love is always for the benefit of the other person. True biblical love. I just felt like doing that. <laughs> no particular reason other than I thought it would. In fact, let me, let me back up again. Yeah, watch, watch it. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Okay, 1 Timothy 1, 5. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Notice there is change. That's what's going on here. Biblical counseling is counseling for change. And make no mistake about that. And it's a change in the person. True personality change. That's, we are, remember what the scripture teaches as believers, and when we come to faith in Christ, what does the scripture say about us? We are new creations in Christ. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. And so we are looking to change the actual person of, of, uh, who is a new believer in faith. The purpose of preaching and counseling is to foster love toward God and love towards one's neighbor. Isn't that the goal of all? Of, isn't that the goal of sanctification? That we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the second great commandment? To love our neighbor as ourselves. And you'll notice as we go through this, there's author, it's authoritative, and it's also loving, and those are not mutually exclusive. So how does the Holy Spirit produce love? It's God's authoritative instruction. Don't ever shy back from saying, you know, when, you hold, when you're speaking about the scriptures, that is, the, you can say, thus saith the Lord. Too many pastors get in the pulpit and they come up with their own ideas and they say, and God said, no, the only time we can say God says is when we're quoting scripture. Not something that we might think. So it's God's authoritative instruction. 
through the ministry of the word. That's, how, that's where we get our authority from. We're going to confront the person who's in sin, the person who is struggling, confront them with the word of God, verbally communicated. That's why you'll see one of the qualifications of biblical counseling is a person must be able to communicate on a verbal or an oral level. Both publicly and privately. Publicly would be the preaching of the word. By the way, if biblical counseling is just the flip side, the tail side of the biblical counseling coin. Preaching from the pulpit is neuthetic confrontation publicly. Counseling is neuthetic confrontation privately. And they should match. That's why when, when I have occasion to counsel somebody who's referred to me from outside the church. Uh, If they're serious about being counseled, I ask them that they need to come to church while they're being counseled by me. Because I want them hearing the same thing from the pulpit that they are from the counseling room. That only makes sense. And love toward God is the fulfillment of his commandments. And we know that because the word says so. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love is a relationship conditioned upon responsibility. I'm not going to expand on that too much, but uh, because we're going to be in 1 John. It's interesting how this has just dovetailed. In 1 John, for the rest of the fourth chapter of the book of 1 John, It's all about love. And so we're going to be talking about that Sunday and for several Sundays after that even. So love is a relationship conditioned upon responsibility. Remember, biblical love is not primarily a feeling or an emotion. It does follow, all right? Paul says he confronted them with tears. So there is that emotional side to it, but it's based upon responsibility. Paul felt responsible to to the elders at uh, Ephesus, and even warning them, admonishing them that savage wolves were going to come and cautioning them. That's a perfect example of biblical euthetic confrontation. Holy Spirit-empowered preaching and counseling that proclaims the principles and commandments of God, God's word, enables people to, and there's a few things that it enables people to do. Become pure in heart, we saw that right from 1 Timothy 5, 1, 1, 5. To become pure in heart. That's one of the goals. Where do we see that? How, how can I say that so blatantly, so authoritatively? Go ahead. Yeah, it's in, the, it's in the Beatitudes. And what we know about the Beatitudes is that's not something that we are to strive for. That is the characteristics of the true believer at least in seed form, and you can grow in purity in heart, but blessed are the pure in heart. Can have peace in their conscience. The only way you can have peace in your conscience is when you follow the steps of forgiveness, repentance, etc., which we'll get to later on. To trust God sincerely, that's one of the most important things, is teaching people. One of the biggest problems that we have in counseling is people come in and they don't really trust God. You say, oh yeah, but, but why did God do this? Well, because he knows better than you. That's a simple answer. All right. One of the main goals of biblical counseling is to bring man into loving conformity to the law of God. Now again, you'll hear, unfortunately, you hear some very poor preaching out there saying, oh, grace of God, law of God, two different things. You know, they're, they're in contradiction to one another. We're in a dispensation of grace. You know, the law of, is, is passed. No, no. If, you know, we are told that we are, by the grace of God, we are enabled to keep the law of God, not for salvation, but to teach us what is the goal of, of being conformed to the image of Christ. That's what the law of God does. The law of God brings us to the place to where we realize that we are unable to do that on our own. 
And so we need the grace of God to bring us so that we can love to do and strive to obey the commandments of God. Does everybody understand that? You don't, there's, there's the two errors. There's that libertarianism where uh, the law of God doesn't apply to us at all. Or you have the, the, uh, the, the, the restrictive type who says, you know, tries to impose the law of God for, for salvation. Both sides are, are errors. Authority and counseling. Biblical counseling uses authoritative instruction. It must be authoritative. You don't some, tell somebody, you know, what does a doctor do when, when you're sick and he knows the cure? Well, if you take this pill, you'll be, uh, you'll be healed. You don't have to take it if you don't want to. That makes no sense. If you're, if you're counseling with somebody and they are in clear violation of the word of God, you have to say, look, this is what the word of God says. You are violating that. That's the problem that you're having. You have to repent of what you've done, you know, ask for forgiveness, and then start to practice righteousness. So, and that's authoritative. Authoritative instruction uses directive techniques opposed to Rogerian non-directive techniques. And like I say, next week, not next week, two weeks, we will go, go through that. I'll, I'll show you a chart that shows the difference between what a Rogerian psychologist would say and what a biblical counselor would say under certain circumstances. Authoritative instruction presupposes that there is a right and wrong way to deal with the problem. It, it, it amazes me to think of how much of secular psychology goes in and, and will tell you, oh, well, no, there is no right or wrong in your problem, you know. I'm not going to tell you it's wrong to stick up a bank. The consequences might be severe, but, you know, I'm not going to tell you that it's wrong to do that. Freudian psychology says the way, to, the way to get rid of the guilt feelings you have is to change your boundaries. So, oh, it's not wrong to kill somebody if, you, if they really make you mad. Now, again, that's an exaggeration, but you get the point. And here's an important point. The source of all mankind's problems began in the Garden of Eden. Sin entered into the world through them, and hence even our physical ail ailments are, in that sense, result of sin. But I'm not, here I'm not talking about original sin in particular. I'm talking about how Adam dealt with the, his first sin. And nothing has changed in how many years. What happened? Ever since the fall of Adam, man has emulated his response to sin. What happened? Adam disobeyed God. Don't eat of the tree, Adam ate of the tree. Adam's conscience was awakened. He knew he, he, knew he was naked, and so what did he do? He became afraid. And he tried to cover his sin, he fled, and he hid. God confronted him authoritatively. And what does Adam do? He resorted to excuses and blame shifting. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what we all do? When we do something wrong, we, we sin. We know we're sin because we have the conscience. We become afraid. We try to cover it, you know. Little kids. I'm, I'm amazed now with how many, I've, I've got seven kids, 19 grandkids, and five great grand. They all follow the same mold. And I was amazed at my kids when they were toddlers, before, before we even taught them that it was right or wrong, when they'd steal candy from the candy dish, where would we find them? Behind the couch, eating it. <laughs> Didn't have to tell them that it was wrong. They knew it was wrong. Right. I see some smiles. <laughs> Did you do that, Cassie? <laughs> okay. So to reverse the natural response, the counselor stresses 
turning to God instead of running and hiding. And there's four biblical responses. How, do you, how should we respond to sin? Firstly, assume responsibility. The devil didn't make me do it. I did it. Read Psalm 51. This is an example of how to do this. Admission of guilt. Yes, I did it. Confession of sin. And then the seeking of forgiveness. And that's just laying the, the groundwork for what's going to come later on as we go, actually go through how to counsel somebody. I, I put this in qualifications for counseling biblically, and I, I put this in specifically because remember what I said, all Christians should be qualified to counsel. But if you're looking to do it a little bit more seriously, maybe even under the uh, auspices of, of the church, um, I, I just figured it would be helpful to see what qualifications are necessary. Paul gives two qualities in Romans 15, 14. And then he gives another one in Colossians 3, 16. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and also able to admonish one another. Admonish, there's that word, nutheteo. Okay, but notice goodness and knowledge. And then Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So we see three specific characteristics. Knowledge, you have to know the word. If you don't know the word of God, you have no business counseling because that's your authority. Goodness, and I'll get into what, I'll define these in just a minute. Goodness and wisdom. Knowledge, knowing what the scripture says and what it means. So that means there has to be a certain amount of study. That's why I say all mature Christians should be competent to counsel because mature Christians should be able to interpret the word of God. Goodness, outside of the normal usage of the word, being empathetic to the issues of life that affect people, and is enthusiastic for the life in Christ. Looking for the best in the other person and trying to bring that person into, into conformity with the word of God. Wisdom, well, what's the definition of wisdom? Oh, that's very good. Huh? And the ability to handle life with skill, that's the one that we've used in the past here. Uh, Jay Adams uses different ones, which I kind of like, so I put his in. The practical application of knowledge, behavior consistent with biblical morality, and wisdom is the skillful use of divine truth for God's glory. But all the answers you gave, they were all spot on. Wisdom is actually the practical using of the word of God in everyday life. Therefore, the counselor must know and understand the word of God. These are the qualifications. Know and understand the word of God. Know how to apply it in everyday life. Be applying the word to his own life. If you're not applying it to your own life and you're counseling others, what does that make you? A hypocrite. Be able to communicate truth to others, and that means you have to be able to be somewhat articulate in your speech. Can biblical counsel fail? What do you think? Yes, it can. Several reasons. Counseling can fail, firstly, because people are sinners. They may just not follow through on what they're supposed to do. So you can give somebody all the best counsel in the world, be right on target with it, do it eloquently, you know, do it with a golden tongue. And, uh, oh, by the way, you've heard of John Chrysostom. 
Does everybody know that John, he was one of the early church fathers? That's not his name. Chrysostom is not his part of his name. That was the name that was given to him. It means golden throat. He was such an eloquent speaker that they actually called him golden throat. So that John, when you see John Chrysostom, interesting, people don't realize that. That was just an extra I threw in. <laughs> Counseling can fail because people can settle for less than total change. Somebody's struggling, they're, they're depressed, you come in, you give them a little bit of counsel, and you, you're working through the issues, and all of a sudden the, the situation relieves itself. They say, oh, that's it, that's it. I'm good. Say, so, no, you're not. You know, you got, you're not finished with. But people can be stubborn. Counseling can fail if the counselor becomes too sympathetic and his judgment is clouded. You need to be involved with the counselee, but you also have to make sure that you don't become too sympathetic and, and not follow through with what you're supposed to do. Counseling can fail if the counselor ends too quickly. Now, I don't believe in long, drawn-out counseling, but you can, there is such a thing as ending it too quickly as well. Counseling can fail if the counselor abuses his authority. Remember, biblical counseling is, is voluntary, unless it comes to the church, unless, according to Matthew 18, discipline. Discipline is the end of somebody who is rejecting biblical counseling and, and is in, involved in serious or gross sin. And then I figured I'd just throw this in so that you maybe can understand things from a pastor's point of view just for a few, few seconds. These qualifications describe the biblical elder. That's why all pastors must be counselors. Not that they all must practice it all the time, but they must be competent to counsel. A biblical pastor is lovingly frank with his people. Lovingly frank. You know, you got to, you have to take the truth of God and wrap it in love. It's like, you know, if somebody has bad breath, there's, you, you know, you can ask them, you know, would, would you like a mint? Or you could say, you're still chewing on your old socks, huh? <laughs> no, ask them if they want a mint. <laughs> a pastor is willing to confront his people for their good and God's glory. He's specific and tries to bring correction in a straightforward manner. Not beating around the bush, but being direct but wrapped in love. And then the pastor's whole life should be marked by neuthetic orientation. I just figured I'd throw that in, maybe help you understand some of the things that we as the Board of Elders uh, are involved with, and it's not always easy. And with that, are there any thoughts or questions? <laughs>